So this is the second part of our neuroendocrine series. We're talking about telegnostic principles and managing neuroendocrine tumors. This is a slightly postponed date. We've got all our speakers today. The key thing is it's principles of, and I think each and every one of those talks that we see today can take an hour plus each. So it's just getting through some really basic ideas out there. We have some really excellent speakers who actually are very highly experienced in our center dealing with neuroendocrine tumor week in, week out. So we start off with uh, Dr. Tom Westwood um, talking about a rationale of the diagnostic slash PRRT approach to NET. Tom, um, off to you. Yeah, thank you, Prakash. Um, I'm just going to share my talk. So hopefully that will come through for you now. Um, so I'm Tom Westwood. I'm a consultant radionuclide radiologist uh, here at the Christie, and my talk uh, serves as an introduction to PRT or molecular radiotherapy as a treatment for neuroendocrine tumor. Um, I, it says I'm sharing my screen. I can't see that I am, but hopefully everyone is receiving that. Um, you'll have to let me know through the chat if you're not. Um, so I'm trying to cater for quite a broad uh, audience with this talk, but um, if you've been to any uh, talks at all on MRT before, you'll have come across this concept, which is a sort of saying, if, is, if we can see it, we can treat it. Um, and the reason that keeps coming up is because it's quite a useful summary of the concept behind um, molecular radiotherapy, in that if we can image a biological process, we can use that same technology, um, slightly altered to deliver radiotherapy treatment. And that really comes back to the basic radio ligand principle, um, which is um, we choose a, um, a biological process to target, in this case with neuroendocrine tumor, the somatostatin receptor on the cell surface. Um, we use a synthetic, um, uh, um, you know, protein, if you like, to, to, to bind that receptor. And that is linked to a radioisotope, in this case, gallium-68, which we can image using PET. The reason that works is because normal cells do not express a great deal of somatostatin receptors in general, and therefore um, don't bind much of the radial ligand and don't provide much signal to your PET image. Whereas in contrast, a neuroendocrine tumor cell, if it's well differentiated, will express a great deal of somatostatin receptors and bind comparatively uh, much more of the radionuclide and provide a lot more signal to your PET image. Um, so that's the imaging principle, but if we sort of hijack that and swap out the gallium for a, um, a radioisotope that has a higher energy, um, then that uh, higher energy will be delivered to the to the binding cell and to the cells adjacent to it um, and will either or can either um, kill those cells or, or stop them dividing successfully and that's the the theragnostic principle um, in the case of neuroendocrine tumor um, we swap out the gallium for lutetium 177 um, lutetium-177 decays by a sort of medium energy beta negative uh, decay, which gives it its therapeutic effect. Um, but it is also helpful. It has some gamma emissions, which allow it to be imaged with uh, SPECT um, nucleus scintigraphy. Um, and it also has a convenient half-life that makes it sort of suitable for use as a therapeutic agent. And the advantage of treating in this way compared to um, external beam radiotherapy is that you can give larger doses to smaller areas and a um, much more targeted approach um, to disease sites throughout the body. Um, you can even treat microscopic disease sites with a lower systemic toxicity than, for example, um, by comparison, giving uh, external beam radiotherapy to sort of extended um, uh, areas of the body. A quick example of that is this patient who had a PET CT scan, which you can see on the left of the screen. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but um, on the left image is uh, the, the gallium PET CT, which shows um, gallium uptake in the pelvis and the retroperitoneum. And the images in the middle and the right are the post P 
PRT images, which show the same distribution of uptake after injection of, of, uh, of lutetium. Um, so there's your concept. If we, if we can see it, we can treat it. So this is quite a elegant way of treating people um, compared to just kind of shining radiotherapy in through the, the skin surface, but we need to know that it actually works. The evidence breakthrough for, for PRT really came with the NETA-1 trial in 2017, um, and that trial compared, uh, well, randomized about 230 patients to either conventional somatostatin analog therapy or um, lutetium PRT um, in the context of well-differentiated mid-gut neuroendocrine tumors. And the primary endpoint for that trial was progression-free survival. So um, progression-free survival on standard um, octreotide analog therapy was eight months, uh, compared with um, 40 months in the lutetium arm. So substantially increased progression-free survival in the lutetium arm of the trial. Uh, there was also a trend towards improved survival in the lutetium arm, but at final five-year follow-up, that wasn't shown to be statistically significant. The investigators proposed that that might have been because quite a high proportion of the patients in the control arm, once they reached progression, actually switched over to having lutetium, um, which uh, you know reduces your ability to, to demonstrate a survival difference over the five-year um, period. On the basis of that evidence, uh, NICE, who is the body in the UK that, or at least in England, that, um, that uh, suggests whether treatment should be funded, um, gave approval or guidance that suggested this should be funded for um, patients uh, given a certain set of criteria being met. Those criteria were that the tumors must be well differentiated, so grade one or grade two tumors. Um, they should be patients with inoperable uh, metastatic gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumor um, with disease progression on first line therapy. So essentially approved it as a second line treatment. Um, lung nets weren't approved. They stipulated that the majority of tumor sites should show increased uptake i've said on gallium dotapeptide but um actually that was just somatostatin receptor imaging in general and that life expectancy should be three months um so these were pretty uh, sensible um criteria really based on the evidence um but they do leave some ambiguity such as uh, exactly what um, constitutes disease progression for example one of the other questions that comes up is is in because the guidance discusses somatostatin receptor imaging specifically. And um, one of the questions that comes up is, is what is the role for FDG PET in this context? Um, so just a quick touch on that. The, the main take home message here is that for the majority of these patients, um, FDG PET CT isn't a necessary part of deciding whether PRT is appropriate. So as an example, we've got a patient here who had a, a breast mass that had neuroendocrine tumor differentiation and poor uptake on gallium PET, so um, little evidence of somatostatin receptor expression. Um, we would have known from their previous contrast enhanced CT and their uh, CT component of their PET scan that they had much more extensive disease than we than were showing gallium uptake. So therefore, um, doing an FDG to decide on that whether PRT was appropriate is is kind of superfluous. That we know from the pet, the gallium pet, that it's not appropriate. Where FDG PET CT becomes useful is as a problem-solving tool. So, um, say for example, you have a patient who the majority of disease sites are showing good uptake on gallium PET CT, but um, a minority show less. Um, uptake than expected, you may want to perform an FDG PET CT to ensure that you're not underestimating the amount of somatostatin receptor negative disease. So for example, you know, sometimes um, disease can be um, inconspicuous in the bones. Um, you don't want to underestimate that before giving PRT. So that's the context in which uh, FDG PET is, is viable in, in these patients. Another group where the guidance is a little bit ambiguous is at the moment um, the sort of subset of patients who have well differentiated but aggressive high-grade tumors are 
eligible for treatment, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a good treatment option and that you should perform PRT in those patients because they often progress too rapidly and do badly. Um, so there's, a, there's, a, there's, there's several trials that are open at the moment that aim to address the question of um, the use of PRT in those patients over the, over the coming years. Who shouldn't you treat? Um, all the absolute contraindications are quite straightforward. Um, patients who are pregnant or breastfeeding or patients who are very unwell um, shouldn't be treated. Um, but the reason for, for kind of relative contraindications is it's often difficult to decide when patients become too unwell to treat. Um, so that's the, the sort of balancing act that you tread when you're deciding which patients to treat. Um, a detailed sort of overview of that is, is sort of beyond the uh, beyond the scope of this talk, unfortunately. Um, how do we deliver the therapy? Um, we are at the moment funded to deliver PRT as, um, a, you know, a, the, the treatment consists of four infusions of 7.4 gigabacterel of, of lutetium dosate. Um, the recommended interval between infusions being eight weeks. Um, there is some flexibility in that we can increase the duration between infusions to give patients bone marrow longer to recover, and we can decrease the um, dose of lutetium if we don't think that they will tolerate the full dose. But we aren't able to give um, more than four infusions, which is somewhat restrictive for unwell patients. Um, and the part of the reason for that is likely to be the cost, because this is not a, a cheap treatment. So four administrations, according to NICE, costs uh, just over £70,000. Um, so in summary, um, PRT offers substantially improved progression-free survival for those patients with well-differentiated somatostatin receptor positive JEP nets, um, but it's a complex therapy and some of those complexities are going to be discussed in the following talks by my colleagues. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Uh, good, nice summary to have to see. We're going to move quickly on to uh, Jill Tipping, who's going to talk to us about dosimetry in NETPRRT. Jill, thank you. Hello, I'm Jill Tipping. I'm a medical physicist at the Christie, and I've been working closely with the clinical team, looking at aspects of how dosimetry within the context of PRRT with lutetium dotatate can help us. So first of all, the question is, why do we do dosimetry? Um, because the major thing is we know when we are um, giving a radioactive therapy that there is quite an uncertain relationship between the administered activity and the absorbed radiation dose to both the tumour and the normal tissues as sort of uh, represented by the, the little figure on my right. But in external rate beam radiotherapy, we would not go ahead without information from dosimetry. We can prescribe to a dose. So how does it fit in with the broad scheme of things? We wouldn't be doing it if we didn't think we could improve patient outcomes. If you translate the EU directive, uh, we're under the same legislation. It's, it's a legal requirement to at least consider dose. And in terms of the um, NHS, it, it satisfies a lot of the good things that we're asked to do, in particular personalised treatment. The questions we have are how precise can we make it and how do we demonstrate the outcomes and how will it help improve cancer survival rates? In terms of dosimetry, what can it tell us? Well, we think of um, our patient's response in terms of both organs of at risk and tumours. And the two most common organs at risk are the kidneys and the bone marrow, because those are the ones that are going to be affected and show toxicities as a side effect of our treatment. We look at the dosed kidneys. The received wisdom is it shouldn't go above 23 gray. We can monitor that through kidney toxicities, measurements of GFRs. Um, and that wisdom comes from mostly evidence from external beam radiotherapy. But of course, that's a very different procedure to what we're doing. Bone marrow is obviously an organ at risk. 
The received wisdom is that our cumulative dose limit shouldn't be above two gray. Um, we can perceive the toxicities from this with the various hematological toxicities. Where does that evidence come from? Both external beam and other therapies, notably with iodine-131 MIBG. So again, our evidence isn't matching what the therapy we're doing. In terms of the tumours, well, as we've briefly seen, they can uh, cover a very wide range of dose depending on size and uptake. And we've had reports of everything from 2 gray to 200 gray. And the key element is what is the dose response with that and how we can optimise it. Briefly, the optimization that I'm going to talk about is the one similar to in external beam radiotherapy, where because um, normal tissue has a different response to the radiation to the tumor tissue, you can actually find a spot on the two different response curves where a very small uh, change in dose will give a small change in normal tissue damage, but a much more improved tumor control. And it, the, the, really the evidence is trying to find that sweet spot because at the moment we tend to treat, as we say, to uh, 7.4 gigabecquerel of lutetium. And the evidence is that we, in general, this sort of conservative treatment will be treating to below the optimization curve. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to bang on a drum, but there is evidence we can do better. Briefly, we've had to go through a lot of hoops to get to the level where we can effectively say, yes, we can do dosimetry for molecular radiotherapies. We've needed to play catch up with the type of technology, the cameras, hybrid cameras, computer modeling and techniques. Um, to be able to say, yes, now we can do dosimetry using high-level computing and Monte Carlo techniques following what we know as the MERGE system. Also, we have to consider that dosimetry is not straightforward and that um, it's the gamma cameras have to be set up and tested to be quantitative to standards shown in, in the article at the top here. And also the time requirements of doing dosimetry are draining because effectively we need a series of scans to follow the passage, the uptake and elimination of our agents over a week or so, preferably with SPECT CT. In some cases, we can use one SPECT and, and the rest are whole body scans, but we need a minimum of three scans, ideally more. So this means we have heavy requirements on the patient and the department. So also, we're often delivering PRRT in four cycles, so we need to be able to consider cumulative doses. Are we <coughs> sentencing our patients to 16 or so SPECT CT scans? We also need very specific software because once we have our sequences of SPECT and CT scans, we're going to need software to carry out registration, segmentation, dose calculations to the whole series of scans. And if they're able to work at the voxel level rather than at the mean level, we should be able to get information such as dose volume histograms, mean doses, maximum doses, and ideally, although not fully in operation yet, we should also be able to translate absorbed dose to biological equivalents. And then we can start to compare the effects of MRT with external beam radiotherapy. But to be used clinically, dosimetry software must be CE marked and or FDA approved. And this has been a real stumbling block because it's also been really expensive to develop. There are many centers with in-house systems that actually can often be better validated, but they can only be used for research. So here is just a sample of the, the commercial systems with their 
various uses. These ones are all appropriate for PRRT dosimetry. Um, there are lots of work being done on cross comparisons of these various systems. And I, I'll briefly mention um, the internal dosimetry user group, IDUG, that is helping to coordinate some of these efforts um, to compare systems. I wanted to briefly mention this report of the Royal College of Physicians, the Institute of Physics and Engineering and Medicine, the BNMS, and the Royal College of, Radi of Radiologists. Um, this looked very closely. It only came out last year at the provision of molecular radiotherapy and, um, across the UK, and in particular, looking at the provision of both therapy and dosimetry. And it states reasons why there is such a wide postcode lottery in variation across the country, um, including lack of trained staff, lack of physical facilities, variations in NHS reversement. But it also marked that the requirement to deliver molecular radiotherapy is likely to increase dramatically. And with that, the requirement for dosimetry. And this is going to be particularly driven by the increase on in the popular uptake of PRRT. And if NICE announces it, the, the use of lutetium-177 PSMA as well. So within this report, if you can see, this is just to express the, the large geographical variation in the um, availability and facilities to deliver PRRT across the UK. And in the table above, this was looking at the number of centres of which 49 responded to this. Um, and only seven out of those were being able to deliver SPECT or SPECT CT, SPECT CT imaging after every treatment cycle. Um, and only six of them were able to deliver dosimetry after each treatment cycle. So clearly, it's um, still a long way to go with being able to have routine dosimetry available for um, PRRT. There are lots of resource implications um, to do with the dosimetry setting the service up and for ongoing support. It's a multidisciplinary area requiring a whole range of trained staff to work together. That's including medical physicists for the computing, the nuclear medicine technologists and radiographers for their expertise in imaging. Uh, nurses for blood sampling and med administration of other medications, physicians and radiologists for their expertise in looking at the images and um, outlining and uh, helping volume outlining. And the whole department itself must be able to accommodate the amount of scanning facilities and repeating imaging required if we're serious about wanting to do dosimetry. So is it worth the effort? Well, we hope we can produce better patient outcomes. That's the whole idea. Reduce disease-related complications. We hope we could prove if treatment is contraindicated, if the dosimetry shows that the tubers are not taking up sufficient to give a, a, a dose that will give, give effect. We could be showing that the dose would demonstrate we need fewer or more factions of treatment needed for the same response, or the dosimetry may demonstrate that we need to do more fractions of lower administered activity. So there's lots of information that we could use. And one of the arguments has been that development of dosimetry services is that Many centres have devised their own techniques, but now we have access to standardised guidelines from the EANM, most recently being the ones for lutetium dosotate and PSMA. So at least we have guidelines we are all actively encouraged to work to now. So let's talk about neuroendocrine tumours in, in, in detail. The NETA trial was a huge success, but I'm going to say, where is the dosimetry? 
only 20 patients out of the whole trial were considered for dosimetry. And the dosimetry was such that the trial was able to prove that no organs at risk were anywhere near the these sort of upper limits that have been recommended by other modalities. Um, so it's a safe treatment. We still obviously are very aware of the side effects and the toxicities. So every clinician will be looking at renal toxicity, hematological toxicity. But at least we, in general, we, we understand that it is a safe treatment. But we do know a little bit more about tumor dose responses. Um, I'm aware of time, but several studies now have come out um, where we've, we've shown that in order to get response in terms of tumor shrinkage um, and other measurable out times, we're looking at a about 130 to 150 grain. There's very little response below 30 grain. Okay, that's just three little studies showing this response, but you can also see it in, in, in uptake through sequential cycles as well, that there is tumor response. What I wanted to talk about was this study called the Illuminate study that came from Sweden. The idea was that they use standard 7.4 gigabecquerel um, administrations, but they followed the accumulative kidney dose and coupled that with uh, extreme monitoring of the patients and their toxicities. And what they demonstrated was twofold in that some patients could only withstand three administrations to the typical 20, in this case, we're talking biological dose, so it's 27 grain, um, whereas the, the, the patient next to that could take six treatments to reach that. But it also demonstrated that others who showed no toxicity throughout the sequence of treatments could successfully withstand further cycles in some cases up to nine cycles to up to a maximum, they, they did cap at 40 grain. But this is partly evidence that, that the levels that we're working to are may not be totally appropriate for lutetium-177. Um, this is the first evidence that we can be considering um, optimizing by optimizing on a kidney dose to get us into more activity, therefore more dose into the tumours. They have recently published their findings. Um, but, um, what you may not very seem very clear, but in practice, yes, some studies have already shown that going maximising and, and, and going up to 23 grey to the kidneys, you were able to extend uh, progression-free survival from 15 months to 33 months and um, improving overall survival as well. With the Illuminate study, this broke that into three arms, and I'm just going to add that in to show that we get a further and much more enhanced separation now with these few patients that we're able to take above the 29 grain. So we're able to really improve patient outcomes by focusing on this type of dosimetry. This is also shown in an Italian study um, where they were working to 23 gray, but again, showing enhanced survival. There has been work considered on how we can improve on the onerous burden for both centers and patients. Um, and several across Europe and Australia, several centers have proposed trying single time point dosimetry. So that just requires one image per sequence. There have been many, many different ways of attempting this, trying to find the best time point, the best technique to work this out. And we're still looking at a spread of well over 100% from the true dose of what we should be getting. It's, it's a work in progress. It's not as with accurate, obviously, but coupled with other data such as a GFR, it may serve to glide clinicians through the sequence of treatments. Just wanted to briefly outline another use of dosimetry. 
um, in particular patient at the Christie, we knew in advance they had renal problems with an extremely low GFR, which would have normally precluded them, but there were other medical complications are refractory to virtually everything else that they'd been treated with. So it was decided to go ahead with caution and dose symmetry. Special lung infusions because of the renal problems and inpatient treatment, patients require full dose symmetry. Why did we do all this? Well, we felt that that, well, we, we looked at the tumor dosimetry and we can immediately see there was a 150 gray or so to the hepatic tumors, not as well in the extra hepatic tumor. But we were expected to see large kidney doses, but this wasn't held up with the imaging that we were able to see with virtually no renal uptake. So instead, our focus moved to the bone marrow dosimetry and the bone marrow is irradiated by the circling blood because the kidneys were not taking the radioactive agent out of the circulating blood. And in fact, we showed that within just one cycle, this patient received 1.8 gray in the bone marrow. So obviously the decision was made that we needed extreme caution to proceed any further. Um, and sadly, this gentleman was too ill to carry on. So finally, what am I saying? Is this the new normal? Are we in a position yet where we can have a system and work with the clinicians to have full dosimetry led therapy? And thank you very much for bearing with me stumbling through Thank you, Jill. Sorry, I've got to cut in now, Jill. You keep dropping off. I'm sorry about this technical issues. Now we're going to move quickly on to Mary's presentation and then we'll pick up some of these items uh, later on in the Q&A. We might just go over time. I'm sorry about this. So Mary, do you mind starting your presentation, please? Yeah, okay. My name is Mary Bongay. I'm one of the nuclear medicine radiographers at the Christie here. And I'm just giving this talk on how we sort our patients out when they come for this treatment. So it's going to be basically everything that we do and how we do things to make sure they are safe and we can carry out this treatment safely, especially if they are deemed as a high risk where they can get um, reaction from the um, treatment itself. So I'm going to talk through all from the little instruments that we use and how we manage them in terms of any um, problems and issues that we encounter. So um, before we have our patients, there are lots of background work that we do before we even bring them in. And um, we usually make sure we get the patient details beforehand and do a little bit of research to ensure that we're going to be safe. So the first thing we do on the day is room preparation and we get all our available equipment that we need and um, we ensure that they are in working order because it's absolutely vital that everything that we use is of working order. Reclining chairs are used, used, usually useful when the patient is very poorly, we can recline the chair and able to treat them. Um, resource trolley is available that is checked every morning and every day and is replenished as and when it's necessary. We have oxygen and again, we don't have any piped oxygen in the room that we use currently. So we have to ensure that our oxygen is full. Um, we've got masks, we've got everything that is needed. We've got Dynamat to ensure um, to get patients vitals, which is what we take before so that we have like a baseline before we start to treat. And during treatment, um, along the way, we've got stops where we have to monitor them and then we do a dose rate. Um, again, if they're very poorly, it's very, very absolutely apparent that we do check their vital signs. Um, they, now we only use two drip stands. One is for um, where we get the patient's treatment through and the other one is again, for the infusion of lysage to protect the kidneys. Um, we always, again, have to have all the things we need because it's really absolutely vital. So I'm not gonna listen to that. And then 
in terms of the patient preparation itself, we have emergency medication. And these are your octreotides, steroids, and again, saline, 250 mils. But we, the octreotide and the steroids, um, we have them in the fridge just to keep them at the temperature that is good for them to be at. And that is now being transferred close by to another fridge where we can easily access it to make sure the patient is, you know, get to on time to, to carry any treatment when they have a reaction. But one of the first things that we do if this patient is, um, is whether it's a new patient or previous patients, is we check the electronic medical uh, notes just to be sure um, we kind of try and understand any previous um, problems with these patients, the current symptoms that they're managing and how, how these symptoms are managed. So we, we have an idea of what they're going through before they even turn up. If the patients have been treated before and we have a record on CRIS, we look at the previous treatment uh, records that, um, that our colleagues have done before, especially if this is the first time we're encountering this patient. So we, we check to see what happened, how it was done, was the, was the treatment slowed down because there's a problem, was the dose reduced because of the bloods. So there are lots of things that we put in in advance before our patients arrive, because as I say, it's absolutely vital that during treatment, we are aware of how to ma manage them and handle them in the case of an emergency. So again, all, uh, all known patients that are at risk are treated as inpatients in most cases, because they, we bring them in the day before and um, they, they stay on the ward. We've got a section in ward four called the BMIU, that's where we, we get these patients to stay overnight. So in most cases, the ward staff will do a blood test and then we'll use that in the morning and we'll get the doctors to consent afterwards when we bring them down to the department. Again, for us, with everything, we have to check that is the right patient, follow our protocols and policies. And we have to insert two uh, intravenous catheters in both arms. There have been times when we couldn't manage this because again, the patient has got difficulties with venous access because they've been on so many treatments and um, it's difficult to be able to access that. In that case, we could get them to have a pick line or um, central line. I know we've, had, we've managed to use those before. Um, blood sample, if it's not already been done in the morning by the ward or the patients um, come in, and um, from home and we treat them and then we take them to the ward. Afterwards, we have to do the blood test, take a blood sample to the lab if there's nothing on the system and then our radiologists can check that and make sure they're happy with what they see. And they, from that, they can determine how much dose this patient is going to have. Um, the other thing that is absolutely vital that we manage to train ourselves on that we, we're doing very well is when I say get to know your patient, it's not only their name and, and, and um, you know, you've met them before, but it's absolutely vital. We kind of know what they look in physical appearance. So if they turn up, um, we know they're having problems and they're very good because they tell us what's been going on because we find out, we ask them how, how have it been since your last statement. So if they're experiencing current symptoms and stuff, they will tell us they're very good to say, yes, I'm still having problems with my stomach or I feel um, a bit sick at the moment. I'm not feeling well. We, we had a patient that was having a problem with insinoma where the blood sugars would spike or would drop. Um, and, and one of the things that the patient did was to let us know straight away that this is going on, that she's struggling with that. She can um, have fluctuations in blood sugar levels, and that can make her very, very sick because of the insinoma. So he, she came with her own, uh, most of them know themselves very well. So she had like a, a, a little survival pack, she called it, where she, she's got everything that she will need in, in, in the case of that happening. So the food that can help her pick up a blood sugar level. So... We, we know beforehand, but we're very good at knowing if, if there's been a rash in the neck where it is and it's known, it's managed. So when we do treat them in the process and we know they're feeling a bit poorly, we know how to handle them. We know what's new, so to speak. Um, the other thing that we need to do, we do it all the time. It doesn't matter if they had it before, is to explain the treatment process. So what's going to happen um, during the treatment? 
And we have a, a treatment checklist that is completed by both the physicists and the, the uh, our staff, radiolo radiographers and technologists as well. So the things that we do before administration, obviously, is to get um, obtain consent from the patients to make sure they're still happy to go ahead and a radiologist will administer anti-sickness. Um, again, check the bloods and give us any instructions to post, um, po um, proceed with treatment. And even before we start the treatment, we always ask them to empty their blood. It's, it's just um, to give them, once we start, we don't get them to go to the toilet until we complete the infusion and we do the first dose rate and then they can go to the toilet. Again, we take vital, um, vital signs to check. We do those to check to make sure um, we know what their baseline is. So if anything is going to drop or anything is going to peak, we know exactly where we can work from. And we also check the potency of the, of the cannulas to make sure they can withhold the amount of fluid we're going to put through them at the amount of speed we're going to use. Because if we think anything is going to compromise our treatment, then we will need to recite the cannulas or we need to kind of reduce the dose. So during the treatment, uh, we start with the uh, visage injection, which runs for 15 minutes before the lithotheria. Um, and then we do, depending on the patient's condition, sometimes we reduce the, um, the way we infuse the, the lithotheria to the patient. There have been patients who really, really slow down the rate to, um, of the administration because sometimes they can react, sometimes they can be violently sick if we do it too fast. So there have been times when we really need to reduce the, um, the flow rate. Again, depending on the blood results um, and patient current symptoms, even the dose of the uh, treatment can be reduced. But normally doses can be delivered um, slower in any rate if the patient is, is struggling. But most times we just carry on as normal and then flush um, the patient's cannula after because we need to make sure we get each and every one of those dose, that dose into the patient. So um, during the treatment, we have radiologists available. Um, they might not be in the room with us, but they, we know they're there and we can uh, access, we can have access to them, we can reach them when we need to. So we assess the patients to make sure they are not developing signs and symptoms that can go with them having a, a carcinoid crisis, like the, the flushing, the unstable blood pressure, heart rate. And um, so we monitor them for all of these uh, and symptoms that I put on here and even more. Again, that's why we said we need to know our patient. We need to know what they look like physically. With. So we monitor them closely during um, treatment. Uh, we perform vital and pulse oximeter checks throughout the process. If we, we, when we know that they are um, high risk and if, you, if they feel poorly, so we try to encourage them, we speak to them regularly, reassuring them and ask them to tell us exactly how they're feeling and what's going on. So we can be able to put in further help out if we need to like get a radiologist to come and actually assess them if we think that they're going really downhill and everything we're doing is not working. So that's why we need to really um, keep an eye on them. And one of the things that as, as radiographers and techs that we do here is we try not to panic because we can, from doing all what we do, we can manage to recover the patients to be well enough to continue with the treatments. But there are times when that is not possible. We're gonna to have to stop the treatment halfway through. So we, we've got a flow chart that we follow in the case of hormonal crisis like that. And um, we get radiologists involved. So far, since we've been doing this now on record, we only have three patients that have experienced this carcinoid crisis since the start, and we've treated over 200 of these patients. So we, we have a flow chart in our uh, treatment room that we usually seem to follow in the case of patient being very unwell. And again, as I say, it's, it's really good when we liaise with our, our radiologist and they're there when we need them for help in treating these patients. So at the end of the treatment, um, all paperwork are scanned into the CRE system. So we have 
a record of what happened during that time. And the patient is transferred to the BMIU, which is where we keep them on ward four. They've got a special unit that is only for patients, uh, radioactive patient. The ward staff are informed to say, yes, we've, we've had this, they've had this treatment and this is what's happened. And we give them a, a basic patient history of what we've um, done and what we need them to do on their side. And in case of anything, what they can help us with and tell us the following morning if the patient is really unwell and let the doctors um, know that they've been poorly overnight or they've been fine. So we follow up with that. And most of the patients, well, all of the patients are scanned the following day and then they can be discharged depending on the health conditions. So that's me, thank you. Thank you, Mary, for the excellent talk. Um, that, thankfully, as Mary indicated, the crisis happens very infrequently and I'd say very rarely. And I think there are ways to try and predict that by actually choosing your patients carefully and managing them as an inpatient, which we do. I'm going to move on very quickly to uh, Ami to start with her presentations with regards to giving case examples, and then we'll pick up some of the questions at the end of the session. I do apologize for some of the technical glitches we're having from time to time. People keep losing out their voices. I do apologize for that. Some gremlins hanging around the system. But Ami, uh, off to you now, thanks. Thanks, Prakash. Um, so I'm Ami Chanda. I'm a radiology consultant and nuclear medicine physician at the Christie, and I'm going to show you some case examples of PRRT. So I've got a mix of clinical and image-based examples. So um, I'm just gonna add a little bit to Mary's talk um, about some clinical points of carcinoid crisis. Um, and talk about our outpatient PRRT service. And then the image-based examples, we'll look at different cases where we've got um, a good response to PRRT, a case where there's progression through PRRT, and a little bit of discussion around the treatment of grade three well-differentiated nets, which we've heard some um, about uh, from Tom. And then there's a case um, which looks at the treatment of non jet nets. So um, for those of you not familiar with that terminology, that's gastroenteropancreatic nets. So nets of the stomach, the bowel and the pancreas. So with carcinoid crisis or exacerbation of carcinoid symptoms, um, the at risk patients are those who have carcinoid symptoms that are not fully controlled with SSA and those with carcinoid heart disease. And that can coincide with very high uh, tumor markers also as a predicting factor. Um, as Mary has said, um, we do reduce the rate of the lutetium-177 dototate infusion. And the rationale behind that is that the receptors don't get flooded and then induce um, the, the onset of symptoms and potentially this uh, life-threatening complication. And also uh, we don't wait for full blown symptoms to treat so they don't have to have um, the low blood pressure. Um, we keep a close eye on their symptoms and if they start flushing more than normal, they start feeling unwell, um, they start having uh, multiple episodes of diarrhea, we will give them um, the treatment uh, kind of prophylactically as well so that we actually catch their symptoms at an early rate when they don't need escalation of treatment and that um, seems to have worked quite well. And I think it probably contributes to the fact that we have, have had so few cases of carcinoid crisis while we've been treating. So um, we treat patients both um, on an inpatient and outpatient basis. Um, and the outpatient uh, PRRT service came about in 2019. So up until that point, they were all inpatients and it was in re response to increasing demand for treatment and with limited inpatient room capacity. So as well as our neuroendocrine tumor patients, we also have other therapies going on. So predominantly um, thyroid ablation with I131 uh, sodium iodide and those patients come in um, for a number of days. Um, so that does mean that there's limited capacity for our patients to fit in along with those. And the number of therapy events has doubled over the last three years and now we're treating up to four patients every week. And the aim was to reserve inpatient slots for the more frail or unwell patients who may need um, medical input. And the selection criteria oops, uh, for those 
was that they should, um, for the outpatients, is that they should have no carcinoid syndrome and no other high risk factors, so advanced age or um, other comorbidities. And um, we added in later local region, uh, because if there's a delay um, with patients getting to their home, and we do treat patients outside the Greater Manchester area, if there's um, traffic on the motorway, for example, and they need the bathroom um, and they can't get to one that uh, represents a radiation, environmental radiation risk. So anybody who's traveling from further away is also an inpatient. And that's worked quite well with us. And it meant that we were well prepared when COVID um, kicked in because we obviously wanted to keep Pay, the duration of patient stay as as short as possible and this allowed us to continue with our service and uh, to keep our patients safe as well. So moving on to the more imaging based cases so the first case is going to show a good response to PRRT so this is a lady um, who was known to have grade 2 net um, of an unknown primary and she presented with bilateral lower limb swelling along with more uh, general symptoms of tiredness and weight loss. And her CT showed that there was a lesion, hypodense lesion within the liver, um, which was suspicious of a liver metastasis. And there was also this abnormal expansion of the IVC and the coronal scan shows that quite nicely as well. And then this low attenuation thrombus going down into the common iliacs. She had progressive unresectable disease and it was decided in the net MDT that she was a potential candidate for PRRT. So she'd been on somatostatin, somatostatin analogs and she progressed. So a gallium PET CT was requested to assess suitability. Um, so this shows axial and coronal uh, images from the PET CT. The liver metastasis um, was highly FDG avid, so it has uptake greater than liver. Um, and so did the tumour that was within the IVC. So the tumours um, have to have uptake at least greater than liver to be um, eligible. Um, so she went on to have PRRT. So this is an, uh, just putting the gallium PET CT MIP there for reference. And this was her, her first um, planar imaging following the first cycle of PRRT. And this was her second one. So she had PRRT between January and July 2018. This, the, this post cycle one image shows that there's good tracer uptake at the known sites of disease. So it follows serognostic principles. When you look following cycle two, the vascular component of the disease is very difficult to identify, which would suggest that there has been response to therapy even after two cycles. Um, and the um, post-therapy CT corroborated that. So here we've got the liver metastasis. And so this is the um, pre um pre-treatment CT and post-treatment CT, and you can see that the IVC has shrunk down to normal. And um, this liver metastasis has also decreased. So this is a, a, a scan that's been performed without IV contrast, but even despite that, there is clear response to therapy. So this was back in 2018, um, and then she further progressed in May 2022 with new liver and progressive lung metastasis. So she had a progression free uh, survival of about four years. So she had a very good response to therapy. The second case um, is the opposite of that. So it shows progression through PRRT. And this is a case of a young man, a 35 year old man who had metastatic grade three, but well differentiated neuroendocrine tumor of the pancreas. Uh, with a KI67 of 30%. And he'd had three lines of previous, previous chemo and then re-challenge with um, TEMCAP and was referred for consideration of PRRT following intrahepatic progression. And you can see from his CT that there is widespread metastatic liver disease. The liver contour is lobulated and there is also hepatomegaly. And this was his gallium PET. So there is diffuse um, disease within the liver, 
And there's also multifocal metastatic and tracer positive disease within his uh, skeleton, which was largely occult on, on CT. And um, this shows the axial fused images. So this is um, a, an important point to stress here is that, um, as I said previously, the lesions have to be tracer positive for the patients to be considered for PRRT. In a patient like this who has so many liver lesions, you have to interrogate the CT and the uh, gallium PET CT together to make sure that the lesions are actually avid or tracer positive. Um, when we when we looked at this, so there's a photopenic area there, but that actually correlated with necrosis rather than tumor. And you can see on the CT that there are necrotic regions. But in patients where the the disease is poorly tracer positive, you can have um, uptake in the background liver, which is greater than the lesions, and you have to be sure that um, that. That that's not the case, that there is actual tracer uptake within the lesions because otherwise you will treat them um, without any clinical benefit and also put them at high risk of liver failure. So that is important. So in this patient, there are a couple of considerations when um, uh, looking at him for therapy. So he was heavily pretreated. And he had a high burden of disease, especially in the liver. So already his uh, functional liver reserve was lower and added into that, the previous lines of chemotherapy would have reduced that further. So we decided to treat him with um, a, a slightly lower dose of um, lutetium 177 dotatate. And we opted for 5.5 for him. So two cycles and then, and then review. So unfortunately, he uh, progressed. So on his pretreatment CT, there was a, a node here at the porta hepatis region. And that had clearly enlarged on the mid-cycle CT. And there was also new peritoneal disease. The liver was much more difficult to assess because this CT was performed without IV contrast and um, the liver was so abnormal anyway that it was difficult to make um, a confident assessment about that, but extrahepatically he had progressed. So um, he was deriving no benefit from treatment. So it was stopped at that point. So just um, a slide about grade three neuroendocrine tumors. So until fairly recently, there were two different categories, so well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumours, which were grade one and grade two, and then poorly differentiated um, carcinomas, uh, which were grade three. And I mean, this is specifically for um, pancreatic nets, but um, it applies sort of more broadly. So now, there, as well as the well-differentiated grade one and two and poorly differentiated, there is now this well-differentiated, more high-grade tumour. And it varies in its behaviour. It can be more indolent, but it can also be aggressive, as the example prior has shown. And there have been some studies on um, grade three nets. So this publication looked at um, the difference in KI67 in these tumours and found that there was a difference in the progression-free survival. So if the KI67 was less than or equal to 55%, progression-free survival was 11 months. But if it was more than 55%, the median progression-free survival was four months. And there are um, ongoing trials or more trials planned, including grade three patients. And we've seen this table already in Tom's talk. So hopefully we'll get a better idea of what the role of PRRT is in these patients. So lastly, uh, non jepnet tumours. Um, so a patient who um, has a CT with quite bulky conglomerate um, masses. And this was felt to be lymphoma initially on um, radiological imaging, also peritoneal nodules. Um, but biopsy demonstrated a paraganglioma and it was too extensive for resection and there was metastatic disease also. A gallium PET CT was performed, and here you can see on the 
that um, it is um, tracer positive and some axial fused images which further demonstrate that this bone metastasis was essentially occult on um, CT again. And an I123 MIBG scan was performed. So this is the four hour planar image, a SPECT CT image and the 24 hour image. So there is a difference in the degree of uptake between MIBG um, and gallium dota. So here there is um, some uptake just above that of uh, background liver. Um, so it, it would be amenable to treatment with I131 MIBG, but the high intensity tracer uptake on gallium PET CT means that that would be the favored approach. Um, we don't treat these patients, so we only treat jet nets, um, the Christie, um, but we can refer on for these. Um, but there's a, a long waiting list, so the patient will have um, I131 MIBG first. So in conclusion, uh, PRRT, pro there's proven benefits in uh, grade one and grade two jet nets. The benefit of PRRT in grade three well differentiated nets still needs to be defined and the place of PRRT in non jet nets is not clear as at the moment. Thank you for your attention. Hey, um, thank you, Ami. So that concludes our really brief introduction to what is quite a complex uh, case mix of patients and process. So if I could get all the panelists back on, please. We're just going to briefly touch a few things. There's one question here that I, I'd like to answer. That's a Q&A question that basically asks why PRT is not considered as a first line treatment widely. I'm going to answer that very quickly. Uh, somatostatin analog works quite well in these patients to actually attenuate the, the tumor, improve symptoms, and then we watch and wait. Some patients who are on SSA actually go for a number of years without requiring any further interventions. And we haven't got a biomarker that's going to pick up which patients are falling into that particular group. So in a way, we start all patients on SSA, get their symptoms under control, look for progression, and we tend to then scan the patients every three months with CT scans or even molecular imaging to try and pick up the patients who are progressing faster and then treat them. Now, PRT, in spite of its good side effect profile, looking at longer term outcomes in patients who have actually done well, there are problems creeping up as the data goes on. So we've already talked about renal function issues that are bone marrow issues as well. So we try and intervene only when it's required. And I think a point of progression after SSA is actually not a bad starting point for treatment. So that's why we tend to not use it currently as a first line treatment. I hope that sort of explains the logic behind that. So Tom, you went through the rationale behind PRRT. I hope that was quite well defined. I, the, the people out there looking at the slides would have picked up that Tom was using immunoglobulins as an example, not the, the our actual SSTR, because the principles apply to all types of tumor, Tom. We sort of get that. Now, Jill talked about uh, dosimetry. I think that is such a tough, tough piece of work for us because you can, you can see how we, suddenly multiply the work of a department exponentially by adding dosimetry into a number of patient groups. And I think we are still learning on how to go ahead and try and do that and how to apply that to the patient, but there's a lot of good work that's happening and we need to carry on with that. Mary, your hand is up and I was gonna talk about, is your hand up? Do you have any questions for us? No, so Mary- No, talked, no, sorry. <laughs> that's fine. Mary talked about how we prep a patient it's very key that you get to know the patient and we rely on our uh, colleagues to actually give us hints about what's happening to the patient pathway. We get phone calls from many different multi-source feedback about how the patient's doing before we actually talk to the patient, actually deal with that patient. And again, the carcinoid crisis, even though it's a, a rare event, is worth preparing the team well for it because it's one thing that everyone's concerned about, but it happens very infrequently. And lastly, Army nicely picked out the kind of cases and the complexity of cases out there. And I do think we haven't actually utilized this technology for all types of different patients. And there's still a lot of work going on to try and get to the bottom of that. I think that's my sort of summary of what we have gone through today. Anything else from the panelists? Would you like to comment anything else, anyone? 
Okay, good. Well, I thank you for joining us in this uh, lunchtime dosimetry. I'm sorry about it dragging on just slightly a bit longer and the sort of technical issues, but that's technology. And we hope to see you uh, again for another session for, for another topic that we'll work on. Dave, thank you very much. And Kevin, take care.